So when a substance goes through a phase change, in other words, it goes from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or a gas to a liquid, or a liquid to a solid, those are called phase changes, right? That's a phase change, meaning that the physical state is is changed, right? Solid, liquid, or gas. But you don't change the composition of the, the chemical. In other words, in case of water, it's still going to always stay as H2O, whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. So when chemicals go through phase changes, their energy changes. So we can say that whenever we're looking at this, energy can either be absorbed or taken into the system, in which case it's going to be endothermic, or energy can be released, and that process is going to be exothermic. So the one I like to always start with is an ice cube. So imagine you have an ice cube in your hand, and you wanted to melt it, right? So we want to go from solid, which is going to be ice, to liquid, which is going to be water, right? So this would be the process of melting, right? So if we want to melt something and you put an ice cube in your hand, what are you going to do to it? Well, you're going to close your hand and squeeze it, right? And what's going to happen is that ice is going to absorb heat, right? Heat is going to be taken in, and that process then is going to be endothermic. So anything that requires heat like that is going to be endothermic. So the other example is if you were going from liquid to a gas, right? And this would be vapor. So here, imagine you have um, uh, water in a pot on a stove and you want it to evaporate, right? So this is going to be vaporization. So if you want something to vaporize or evaporate, you have to heat it. Or if you put a pot of water on your stove and you just stare at it, nothing's going to happen. Um, so in order to make this happen, you have to give it heat. That system then, the water, is going to take that heat in to allow it to undergo the phase change. So melting, vaporization, these processes are going to be endothermic. Um, the reverse processes are all going to be exothermic. So if you take any of these processes and you go this way, so if you were to go from gas to a liquid or liquid to a solid, going in this direction would be exothermic. Exothermic. Right? And everything going in the other direction here is going to be endothermic. All right? Um, the exothermic ones are a little bit harder to visualize, but imagine if you have gas, right? We said gases have high energy because you've got those particles flying all over the place and moving around. And if you're going to change them into a liquid, the particles get much closer together. They don't have as much energy, so they're going to, it's like you're kind of telling the particles to chill out, so they're going to calm down. They're going to have less energy. Well, where does that energy go? Well, we know that energy can't be created nor destroyed, so that energy just has to be given off into the system and it's released as heat. Right? So that's what happens whenever you're going in that direction, going from gas to a liquid or liquid to a solid. All right, so to summarize all of this, here is um, a chart. Right, so endothermic is going to be melting, vaporization. Um, sublimation down here on the bottom is when you go from a solid directly to a gas. So that's going to be sublimation. Um, the example that I think of all the time with that is dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide. It doesn't go into a liquid state. You can have solid carbon dioxide, and as soon as you heat it up, it turns into a gas. Right? Um, the opposite of that, going from a gas over to a solid, so again, you can take um, gaseous carbon dioxide, and if you cool it, it'll turn into a solid, and that is deposition. So these are, the, these are the two processes that kind of skip the liquid phase. But again, in general, anything that requires going um, to a higher energy state is going to be endothermic, um, and then anything moving to a lower energy state is going to be exothermic. Um, so this just kind of uh, goes over what I just talked about. The main reason I want to show this is this topic down here where it says heat of fusion. So the heat of fusion is also, you can think of it as the heat of melting. Um, so fusion actually refers to like the freezing part of it. But the idea here is the same. Um, 
the heat of fusion, basically, if you're going from a solid to a liquid, or if you're going from a liquid back to a solid, either one of these can be described by the heat of fusion. And the idea here is if you're going from a solid to a liquid, it's going to take an input of energy. And if you're going from liquid to a solid, you're going to get energy out, right? It's going to give off energy. Um, both of those can be described by the heat of fusion, which specifically talks about the amount of energy needed to undergo the phase change from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. Now, the next one to look at is going to be the heat of vaporization. So that's going to be the heat that needs to vaporize something. So again, this is going to be going from a liquid to a gas or from a gas back to, to a liquid. Um, in this particular case, the heat of vaporization is going to be different than the heat of fusion. So right, different amounts of energy for each phase change. Um, for this one, it's going to be require an input of energy to go from a liquid to a gas, and you're going to give off energy if you go from a gas back to a liquid. And we can describe all of these um, phase changes using a heating curve or a cooling curve, which would go the other way around. Um, so the idea here is pretty straightforward. You can have something that's a solid, liquid, or a gas. Um, so if you start with something as a solid, so pretend you have something in a freezer, right? And you set your freezer to, we'll do everything in the Celsius scale, right? So remember in the Celsius scale, uh, let's, we'll talk specifically about water. So the Celsius scale goes from um, zero degrees Celsius is going to be ice, and then 100 degrees Celsius it's going to turn into vapor, right? So you go from there to there. But what if you were at negative 100 degrees Celsius, right? Well, that's ice. And at negative 50 degrees Celsius, that's still going to be ice. But that ice is still going to be a little bit warmer at negative 50 than negative 100, all the way until you get to zero degrees. So this is the idea of going from A to B. It's going to be a solid. But that solid keeps getting a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer, until... It goes from B to C, and what you'll notice here is that on B to C, there's like a plateau. And the idea here is that if this axis is temperature, so temperature going up, all right, so your y-axis here is temperature. Whenever something melts, it doesn't change temperature. So melting occurs for ice at zero degrees, but you go from zero degrees ice to zero degrees water. So B this is going to be zero degrees ice. And C is going to be zero degrees water or liquid, right? So melting is the phase change that occurs without changing my zero degrees on ice didn't work. Um, it's going to be the phase change that occurs without changing temperature. And then once you have zero degrees water, then that water can heat up. And it goes from zero to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 until you get to 100 degrees. So at D, you have 100 degrees water, which I'm just saying at water, that's going to be your liquid. And then at E, you're going to have 100 degrees gas. So again, you have a plateau where the temperature doesn't go up, but you still need to add energy in order for that to occur. So the amount of energy you need whoops, for boiling is going to be for the heat of vaporization. So that's how you could calculate how much energy is going to need to boil something. For the melting, you would use the heat of fusion. Okay, so the heat of fusion is going to describe how much energy is required to melt something. The heat of vaporization is going to require how much energy it takes to boil something. So what if you were asked a question, and there are some homework problems in the book like this, that says, let's say you want to take um, something that is zero degrees um, water, you want to heat it to boiling, and then you want to turn it to 100 degrees gas. So in order to go from zero degrees water to 100 degrees water, you would need... For this part, you would need the specific heat. So the specific heat 
allows you to determine how much energy it's going to take to heat something without undergoing a phase change. So the specific heat is going to look at all of these diagonal lines, there, there, and there, all right? And then the plateaus are going to look at the heat of vaporization, all right? So again, the you would start at, say, negative 100 degrees Celsius, and you could figure out how much energy it's going to take to get to zero degrees by looking at the specific heat of um, solid water, right, ice. And then the heat of fusion would tell you how much, you can calculate how much energy it's going to take to melt. And once you're at zero degrees water, you can say, okay, the specific heat of liquid water to get up to 100 degrees Celsius water. Then the heat of vaporization would tell you how much energy it's going to take to boil that water and to get it into the gas. And then if you wanted to heat the gas, you would once again use the specific heat of gaseous water or water vapor to figure out how much energy it's going to take to heat it to whatever your final temperature would be. All right, so that's kind of how you would go through this process with this um, heating curve. A cooling curve is the exact same thing, just going in the other direction. And in this case, instead of heat being put in, heat would be given out. So I'm not going to go through all the details that I just went through on the previous slide. Um, it's all the same, except in this case, energy is going to be released instead of absorbed. So all of these processes you're seeing here would be exothermic, whereas on the previous slide, they were endothermic. All right, so let's look at this problem here. The um, heat, it, I give you the heat of fusion of water and the heat of vaporization of water. 79.7 um, .7 calories per gram and 540 calories per gram. So the first question here is how much energy is released when 40 grams of water condenses? So what I would do to solve this is I would start with my 40.0 grams of water, and I would say, okay, I want it, it's going to condense. So condense means I'm going from a gas to a liquid. All right. So which one of these processes is that? Is that fusion or is that vaporization? Well, vaporization is liquid to a gas. So gas to liquid, it's the same process, just in reverse. So for this one, I'm going to use the heat of vaporization. So I can say that this is going to be 540 calories per gram. And if I look at this, my grams cancel out. And my answer here is going to be um, 40 times 540, which should give me 21,600 calories. And that number has um, three significant figures because of this number here. Again, we're not going to use our conversion. Um, so three significant figures, and I have three significant figures here. I could also write this in case you want to practice more conversions, 21.6 kilocalories. All right, so that would be energy released when the water condenses. So now, on the second question, how much energy is absorbed when 35.5 grams of water melts? So if I have 35.5 grams of water, well, melting is the same as fusion. So vaporization is going to be this one. Fusion is going to be solid to liquid or liquid to solid. So again, it doesn't matter which direction you go. So I'm going to actually write these both as bidirectional arrows there. All right, so 35.5 grams. Now, for this one, again, I said I need the heat of fusion, so it's going to be 79.7 .7 calories per gram. Grams cancels with grams. This is going to get me to 2830 calories. Again, with my three significant figures, or I could say 2.83 kilocalories. Um, so the math is pretty straightforward here. The trick is making sure you know which of these processes to use. Are you going to use the heat of fusion, or are you going to use the heat of vaporization? So just understanding basically these terms for condensation, melting, vaporization, so on and so forth. All right, so the last slide here, um, looking at, in this case, a cooling curve. 
So what state is the substance at 50 degrees? So if I look up here, I can say that 50 degrees is going to be somewhere right around there. Right? So that's going to be 50 degrees Celsius. Well, I can tell by looking at this, I'm going to start up here as a gas, and it's going to go down, down, down as a gas. And then it's going to go from a gas to a liquid, so that's going to be condensation. Then the liquid is going to cool. Liquid is going to cool all the way down to Y. Then from Y to Z, it's going to freeze. Now you're going to have a solid, then your solid would cool. So at 50 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a gas. At 25 degrees Celsius, it's going to be somewhere around there. And then it's going to be a liquid. All right, and then what is happening from W to X? Well, that's what I just said for W to X. That would be the process of condensation. Right, so that's going to be going from a gas to a liquid. And then just, not that it's S, but down here from Y to Z, that would be the process of freezing. All right, so that's how you would do problems like that in terms of understanding what's going to happen as you heat and cool things in terms of the energy and also in terms of um, the description of them.